You're listening to a Frequency Podcast Network production. Just in case you have been under a rock for the last month, you should know our government has been busy assuring Canadians they understand it's hard right now, and they're going to do stuff about it. The federal budget, they have been telling us, will help to make life more affordable, to make housing more attainable, and to make many things better. Just listen. The government has already previewed almost $40 billion in spending, about half of which is set to This budget that we're uh, working on right now will be focused on both supporting Canadians now... We will be launching a new child care expansion loan. As part of our upcoming budget, we're going to create a Canadian renter's... We're fighting every day to build an economy that helps every generation get ahead, including by taking significant measures to make housing... Will we see the deficit grow? No. It is one thing to tease what is in an upcoming budget and to tell Canadians how awesome you think all those things will be. It is another to actually deliver those things, to produce the numbers and the details and have people like economists dig into that and determine how much of a difference your super awesome budget will actually make to Canadians who are struggling to pay the bills. Yesterday, that bill came due, the budget came out. And today, we'll find out, is this budget going to help you? Where and how much? I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Jim Stanford is an economist and the director of the Center for Future Work. He is somebody we call when we need to translate uh, big economic terms into things that impact people's wallets. Hey, Jim. Jordan, how are you? I'm doing really well. I'm glad to talk about this with you because uh, this is the affordability budget, right? That's what they call it, yeah. Let's uh, start with this then. They've been saying that and promising affordability help in this budget for uh, at least a month now as they've kind of made announcements here and there. But before we get into specifics, broadly speaking, how would you grade this budget for the average Canadian who is struggling with their bills right now? Well, I'd give it a B, uh, to be frank. Uh, This budget isn't going to solve the affordability problems uh, that most Canadians are uh, experiencing, and and nor should we expect it to. Most of those problems uh, have very little to do with government and uh, everything to do with how the economy is doing and what companies are up to and what prices we're paying. And those things are all beyond the uh, direct control of government. So uh, I think there's a suite of measures uh, in this, none of them game-changing, but all of them will offer incremental help to different groups of Canadians. And uh, taken as a whole, I I think this budget will make uh, an important positive difference. We'll get into what those things are, but first, you said nothing in here was a game-changer. Was there one bigger thing that maybe stood out to you as something that Canadians will really feel in their finances, either positive or negative? Well, by far the the biggest attention and the most power, uh, if you like, in terms of dollars in the budget is uh, directed towards the the housing issue, which is uh, obviously a crisis affecting anyone who's trying to buy a house or trying to rent an apartment uh, across the country. We've just seen a terrible upsurge in housing costs. So there's, you know, really 15 to 20 different measures uh, under that umbrella. And uh, all told, it's, I I would say, a generational uh, intervention by the federal government in an area that isn't, you know, typically seen as federal jurisdiction. But uh, the government heard that Canadians are are very upset about housing and worried about it for themselves and their kids. And uh, so I I think that that is the, the most important part of the budget. Now, Most of those measures were announced in, uh, you know, various uh, photo ops that uh, top ministers have been having across the country in the last uh, uh, few weeks. So there weren't any giant surprises there. But uh, seeing them uh, as a whole uh, with dollar signs attached to them uh, certainly stands out as the the most important aspect of the budget. And uh, not overnight by any means, but eventually I think it will make a difference to, uh, to the housing challenges we face. And the housing policy is um, so massive that we're actually going to spend another episode of this podcast breaking down, to your point, all the 15 to 20 measures in there. So we'll talk about that more broadly maybe uh, with you today. 
But as you mentioned, as I mentioned off the top, uh, it's been announced in dribs and drabs over the past few weeks. This Mm. is still uh, a massive document for Canadians who have been paying attention to those announcements and kind of expected this housing stuff. Uh, What's actually new in this budget that kind of caught your eye as you looked through it? The thing I was not expecting, Jordan, was uh, what they did on the capital gains uh, tax uh, measures. So on the revenue side. Explain that to us. How does that work? Well, a capital gain is uh, what happens when you buy something and sell it for more than you paid. So you haven't actually done anything. You haven't produced anything. You haven't done any work in an economic sense. You you know, either through good judgment or sheer luck or just riding the coattails of an inflating stock market. Uh, You ended up with an asset that uh, got more valuable over time. In fact, uh, Jordan, if you want to play derivatives, you can actually get a capital gain out of a falling market if you uh, short a stock and uh, end up with... Uh, more money at the end that way. So the idea is that right now we've got an incredibly favorable uh, system that preferences capital gains as a form of income. We we have a partial inclusion uh, system where people who make capital gains, and the vast majority of capital gains are captured by uh, very high-income people, uh, they only have to declare half of that gain on their income tax, mm-hmm. uh, which is a sweet deal. You know, if you, uh, if you flip burgers uh, for a living at McDonald's, all of your income counts on your income tax. If you flip stocks and bonds so to make a speculative profit, you only have to declare half, hmm. which, uh, you know, I think there's a moral issue there, but there's also an economic issue in the sense that it's uh, an incentive for speculating on stuff, whether you're flipping houses or buying and selling fine art and Banksy paintings or whatever else. Uh, you're not actually encouraging production directly. So uh, I think... Uh, Equality advocates for years, myself included, have said this is a ripoff for most people. Uh, it's a very uh, concentrated benefit that's captured by uh, high-income people. And uh, the government now uh, has decided this is the moment to try and roll back some of that. So with uh, some exceptions, they're going to change that inclusion rate from 50% to 66%, two-thirds instead of half. Um, That's frankly lower than it used to be. We used to have a 75% inclusion rate in Canada. And the the first uh, million and a bit of uh, capital gains over your lifetime are are tax-free, and that will continue. And so the 66% rate will only apply to people who get over a quarter of a million capital gains in a given year. And believe me, that's not you and I. So uh, (laughs) all told, I think this is a significant uh, change. They do get, you know, some decent revenue out of it that will help to pay for some of those other things that they're doing. But maybe the politics of it are more important. It's a it's a tax measure clearly targeted, not just to the top 1%, but really the top one-tenth of 1% uh, of Canadians are the ones who are going to uh, be experiencing higher taxes because of this measure. How do you think that's going to go over in the business community and with uh, large income Canadians? I think it's already, um, as we speak on Tuesday night, uh, the most controversial thing in this budget. Well, the number of people directly affected by it is is quite small. They estimate about 40,000 uh, taxpayers, so about one-tenth of one percent. Right. And, you know, you're going to hear from folks, uh, CEOs and top bankers and uh, business lobbyists who are among those 40,000. So we'll have to take their complaints with a grain of salt. Uh, many of them have got personal skin in the game, whereas the vast majority of Canadians don't. Uh, there is an argument that business makes that if you tax capital gains higher, then businesses will invest less. Less. And uh, frankly, I, I don't buy it. Most of the capital gains paid are on speculative assets, not people starting a company or doing something actually productive. Hmm. In fact, at, at the same time, the you know the government's taking with one hand but giving with another. They've got a new uh, entrepreneurship uh, incentive, they call it, whereby if you actually did start a business, now you get an additional uh, $2 million uh, capital gains free hmm. on any uh, gains that you make. So um, the argument that this is going to slow business investment or hurt our productivity or so on, I think is very self-serving. Coming from a small group of people who are among the tiny proportion of our population who will actually pay something more because of this. The vast majority of Canadians, 99.9%, literally, that's not an exaggeration, uh, will pay nothing because of this tax. Well, let's focus on that 99.9% then. And you mentioned housing, and I know it's the biggest thing. Uh, It's something that will take time to fix, especially when it comes to new builds. 
what are some things in this budget uh, that people will notice in the short term, in the sort of months to year uh, out of this? Yeah, the housing measures, by and large, you, you won't notice. Uh, there's a couple of changes to some of the mortgage lending rules that people will be able to take advantage of quickly, but I don't think those will have much impact. And the bigger the bigger programs like loans for apartment building um, and uh, using Canada lands, that is federally owned lands to build new housing on or an idea I, th- I thought was really creative is uh, they're going to spend a, a billion dollars over 10 years to convert federal office buildings into housing. You know, with the work from home phenomena and so on, there's a glut of office space out there. Right. And uh, and there's growing interest in converting them to apartments. So uh, there's the, the federal government itself getting in on that. So uh, all of those, I think, are encouraging, but they are going to take years. The things uh, on the affordability front, uh, Jordan, that I think people will feel more quickly uh, will be some of the, I would say, sort of social program innovations that we're seeing. We've heard about the Pharmacare program, that there is money now in the budget for that. So uh, two drugs initially, birth control and uh, diabetes drugs, will be provided free through that. So mm. that's interesting, and that's going to hit millions of Canadians. Uh, the dental care thing that's rolling out will uh, soon cover 9 million Canadians. The disability benefit, the Canada disability benefit, which has been talked about for a few years, finally has some uh, money in it. Not a whole lot. It's going to be $200 a month for uh, people with a disability that prevents them from uh, working. But I think that's a step towards something that can be expanded down the road and will help us uh, eliminate poverty among people with disabilities. So I think those are some of the things that we'll start feeling. And No single one of them uh, is a magic bullet, but taken together, most Canadians will get something from one of those new programs. And I think that that will be interesting and and certainly uh, ease a bit the cost of living challenges that people are feeling. How much is this budget going to cost? And this is something a couple of us have talked about is should we really care how government affords this stuff when it's Canadians that are feeling a pinch? Um, do we really care that much about, you know, how balanced this budget is? Well, frankly, uh, if there was a non-story in this budget, it is the, the deficit. There is like virtually no change in the deficit and the deficit uh, forecast, uh, which is interesting. Um, despite the, you know, the spate of new programs that the government has announced in recent weeks and, you know, a couple of new ones uh, in the budget today, uh, no change in that deficit profile. And that's partly because of the new revenue that will come in from the uh, capital gains tax that I mentioned. And they, they've also got uh, higher tax on tobacco and vaping products. That's kind of chump change in the big picture. But most of the work, if you like, is just being done by the economy per se. And uh, so the the growth in the economy and, of course, inflation itself. Hmm. A bit of a dirty secret, governments actually benefit from inflation while the rest of us uh, are cursing it. Uh, Government revenues in an inflationary environment like now tend to increase uh, a bit faster than their expenses. And uh, we have seen, uh, I think, through a combination of stronger than expected economic performance. Many economists expected a recession this year, but that hasn't happened. And the, the forecast in the budget doesn't expect one. And they see growth picking up next year, which is a good sign. And combined with higher prices means the government revenue profile is stronger than expected. And that's where most of the money is coming from. So uh, I think for you know some of the government's critics uh, who have been focusing on that deficit issue... Uh, The budget today, in a way, neutralizes that. There's really hardly any news there at all. The numbers are almost exactly the same on the bottom line as they were last year. What about smaller items? I know you mentioned the Pharmacare program, and that's not exactly small, but uh, things that are even smaller than that that are just interesting and things that people should note as, you know, they look at their finances going forward or even just as they walk around in Canada. What, What will this budget change? Uh, well, uh, again, there's there's such a, a range of different initiatives aimed at different, obviously targeted uh, voter blocks. Uh, essentially, uh, one of them I, I think that's interesting is this focus on young people uh, in the budget. Now, I think the Liberals traditionally took for granted that they would be supported by young people, more so than the Conservatives anyway. I think uh, youth support is probably strongest for the NDP and the Greens, but Mm. uh, the Liberals, you know, would position themselves as appealing to youth and modern generation, etc. But they have seen some of that youth support uh, get siphoned off towards the Conservatives. And so they, they clearly made an effort in this budget to address youth issues. So, 
Here's an interesting one that I, I didn't see coming, I hadn't heard about. An initial uh, $500 million for a youth mental health uh, program hmm. uh, to try and get uh, extra um, support for young people to access mental health services. Anyone who's had someone in their family with mental health challenges knows how hard it is to get uh, counseling support or medical support and other, uh, other types of help uh, during a terrible time. So, uh, that's uh, that's an interesting initiative. Uh, also, uh, some new money for grants and loans for students uh, going to college or uh, university, combined with uh, a part of the housing program uh, is obviously aimed at young people too. Uh, some special grants for young people trying to get into the market, but more relevant, I think, will be uh, some protections for renters. Uh, most young people, of course, are renters. So I thought that was an interesting twist to see how they're trying to... Um, you know, put together a package that would appeal to the millennial generation uh, of voters and, I guess, try to shore, shore up their support among younger Canadians. I know you're an economist and not a political analyst, but uh, since you mentioned, you know, where the government is coming from on this, mm -hmm. what impression do you take away from this budget about what this government thinks of its own political situation and, and how it's trying to maneuver? Well, clearly, uh, there's an element of desperation that has motivated the government to come out big with, first of all, so many different initiatives and, you know, as much uh, real money behind them uh, as they have uh, provided. And again, you know, despite that, they're, they're able to meet their uh, previous uh, deficit targets. So we've all seen uh, the polls, and, and Mr. Polyev is far ahead of the Liberals uh, at this moment, and an election is, uh, is coming up in 18 months. So um, clearly the political pressure is motivating the government to both try to do more to help Canadians and be seen to be helping Canadians, but also in a, a kind of strategic way that um, they hope will neutralize some of the attacks that they're getting uh, from the uh, Conservatives. So uh, the Conservatives certainly have been exploiting the anger over the cost of living and the housing crisis and so on, trying to blame government for big spending and causing inflation and high interest rates, which frankly is a far-fetched story in, in economic terms. But Politically, it's been um, uh, beneficial for the Conservatives. And so now you see the government responding and say, well, we are actually going to do something about these cost of living pressures and the housing situation uh, with, by the way, a budget that spends a little bit more than it did before. Um, so I think they have set up uh, a fairly clear um, contrast between their approach to these issues and the Conservatives. And clearly that's been motivated by, uh, by the political pressures the government feels. We've talked a lot about affordability measures. Um, what's ambitious in this budget? Uh, I hear that there is a significant amount of money maybe set aside for artificial intelligence, which is an interesting thing to put uh, in a federal budget. Yeah, it is. Uh, and Jordan, I just hope that section of the budget was written by a human being and not chat GPT. Right. But uh, uh, they have put uh, a couple billion dollars towards supporting mostly uh, the development of supercomputers uh, in Canada. You know that all the AI programmers need these massive uh, computers to, you know, show that their their coding uh, actually makes a difference. And we're, uh, I'd say, behind the curve internationally on that. And they, they, they put some money into that. They've also put uh, extra money into other forms of research, uh, both commercial research and university research and so on. So, um, on the sort of technology and innovation front, uh, I think they recognize that there's more to be done in Canada. And those, I think both those initiatives will be helpful. This is the last thing I'll ask you. And maybe I should have asked it off the top because you mentioned uh, how many different things are in this budget and a little something for everybody. How does this budget compare to uh, a traditional budget, whether that is by a conservative or a liberal government, or just even previous uh, budgets by this government? Um, well, I, I mean, this government since 2015, when when uh, when Trudeau was first elected, has I would say generally been active in its budgets, and uh, initially that was through changing some of the tax parameters. For example, the middle class tax cut and the increase in taxes for the highest income category, and some on the social and environmental policy front, for sure, the national child care program, etc. So I think in a way there's a bit of continuity between what this government's 
been doing and what it's done now, but clearly they've shifted the the focus and the framework uh, for this. The last budget had a lot of initiatives in it aimed around climate change and the energy transition and the big uh, uh, ambitious programs to build uh, clean energy industries in Canada. Um, now they've seen in the last year the the politics and concerns of Canadians change, and the and the budget has changed uh, its focus uh, accordingly. So. You know, in a way, without glorifying it, I'd say this is democracy in action. Uh, both, well, all, all the major parties uh, have a sense that Canadians are angry about the cost of living. They're very angry about what corporations are charging them in, in prices. They're very worried about uh, housing for themselves and their kids. And so this budget has responded to those concerns. And I expect the uh, opposition parties, uh, both the Conservatives and the NDP in English Canada, are going to be trying to take uh, their own response to the same sorts of concerns that Canadians uh, have expressed. So this budget isn't going to fix the problem for sure, but it's going to help a lot of people incrementally. And I think it shows that in Canada, um, our democratic system uh, works enough that governments listen to Canadians and respond when we're pissed off about something. That's a perfect way to put it. Thanks, Jim. Thank you very much, Jordan. Jim Stanford economist and director of the Center for Future Work. That was The Big Story. For more from us, including previous episodes with Jim, you can head to thebigstorypodcast.ca. You can always send us feedback, positive, negative, indifferent, whatever you like. The way to do that is via email, hello at thebigstorypodcast.ca, or, of course, giving us an old-fashioned phone call. The number is 416-935-5935. We won't actually answer the phone, but you can leave a voicemail and rant for as long as you require. Thanks for listening. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. We'll talk tomorrow.